The September 11, 2012 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? President Adair. Here. Mrs. Aldersley. Here. Mr. Ancello. Here. Ms. Andrews. Yes. Mr. Antelli. Here. Mr. Barker. Here. Mr. Baroth. Here. Ms. Boyce. Here. Mr. Colby. Here. Mr. Danielli. Here. Mrs. Draw. Here. Mr. Gamble is excused. Mr. Gamina. Here. Mr. Haney. Here. Mr. Hanna. Here. Mr. Holland. Ms. Kaylee, Mr. John Lightfoot, Mr. Willie Lightfoot, Mr. McCann, Mr. Michike, Mr. O'Brien, Mr. Patterson, Dr. Quattro, Mr. Rocco, Mr. Tucciarello, Mrs. Valerio, Mr. Wilcox, Mr. Yolovich. I believe since most of you just walked up four flights of stairs that my next direction you'll all appreciate. Please stay seated. <laughs> I would like to introduce Pastor George Grace of the First Bible Baptist Church, who's been invited tonight by Legislator Rick Antelli. I had the uh, <clears throat> privilege to be part of the fire alarm debacle and had to walk over many bodies on the way back up the stairs. And uh, consequently, I'd like to extend to all of you legislators a free registration in uh, Race with Grace on Thanksgiving Day. So, <laughs> training will begin this Thursday, and you'll have 10 weeks to get ready for the 10K, all right? Thank you so much. I barely made it myself. I'll be out there training on uh, Thursday also. Would you join me in a word of prayer and thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Father, it is a blessing to be able to come together with uh, so many people who mean so much to our community. Lord, uh, each and every one of them are accomplished in their own way. They aren't here for no reason whatsoever. They're here because of people that they have helped, things that they have accomplished along the way. And uh, Lord, uh, their talent has been pooled to direct, to guide our county, a great place that we live in and, and we enjoy the many services and benefits of it. I thank you for its leadership. I thank you for each of these le legislators that are here tonight. Oh Lord, uh, just for a moment, I want to remember it is uh, September 11th, 11 years ago today, uh, many, many families' lives uh, were changed. Uh, forever and many lives were lost and tonight Lord we thank you for the United States of America and we ask for your protection upon us Lord we pray for comfort for those who have lost loved ones and those who may even be injured in enduring some of the pain today as a result of injuries or some kind of a loss uh, 11 years ago Lord we pray your blessings upon them uh, all day long, I've heard on radio, television, people who have been commemorating and uh, in the right sense, celebrating uh, the lives of those people in our great country. Thank you for them. Now, bless this meeting tonight. Bless these people who have come together. It is my prayer that you would grant them the wisdom of God. We all need that desperately. Lord, that the decisions that they make tonight will certainly benefit uh, the, their constituency. And Lord, that... Uh, and then when folks leave the meeting tonight, that they'll be glad that they were here and they'll feel as though work indeed has been accomplished. Now, I want to thank you, Lord, tonight in my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ's name. It's in his name I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Have a good evening, everybody. On behalf of the whole family. Before we um, begin tonight's meeting, I'd like to take the time. I'd like to take a moment and have a moment of silence and honor for the people that lost their lives on September 11th, 2001. As well as tonight, I'd like to take a moment of silence for the brave members of our military who continue to fight and protect our country each and every day. So I'd like to take a moment of silence at this time. Thank you.
Legislator Mary Valerio, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You have received the copy of the journal of day 9, August 14, 2012. Without exception, the journal stands approved as submitted. There's a hearing loop in place tonight to assist those who are hearing impaired. Anyone requiring assistance should acquire at our clerk's office. If you have a cellular phone, pager, or other electronic device in your possession, we would request that you silence them for the duration of the meeting. And we thank you for your cooperation. Legislators, the referrals submitted to the legislature for the next committee cycle are in your folders. And at this time, it is with a great pleasure and my honor to introduce Mark Quinn from the Monroe County Parks Department, who will now tell us about the plan of the month. Mark. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Um, the plan of the month this month is Camisiparus. Uh, two different species are up here, two of the seven species that are uh, recognized. Um, relatively low number of species, but literally thousands of varieties. Uh, one of the things with this plant is the original species are mostly trees. They grow up to 200 feet tall on the west coast. Uh, but what the industry has done is developed a lot of shrubs from uh, genetic mutations of the trees. So what we've got up here will probably not grow more than about 8 feet tall. Canisipris is an interesting plant because, one, it's, most of the varieties you buy are relatively uh, low-growing, slow-growing, uh, take very little maintenance because they're slow-growing and don't get out of control. So you can have a nice compact shrub in the yard that will stay that way for a long period of time. So it's a, it's a nice plant material to use in that respect. They're relatively deer resistant and they like a lot of sun. Specifically the ones that are yellow, like the ones you're seeing in the middle here, uh, prefer a sunny site. Uh, some of the varieties you can find will, uh, will take some shade, but mostly they prefer a good sunny site. Uh, again, there's a lot of yellows, greens, uh, there's a, quite a few blues out there too. And in the industry you'll see about three different species a lot. The two that we have here, plus a tree that's called Nucatensis, which is uh, a small tree form, usually a weeping tree, tends to be uh, a very ornamental type thing. So those are the three forms you'd see if you went to a nursery to buy, buy them. Um, again, they're very nice in the landscape. They come in a variety of uh, shapes and, and sizes. Uh, they use them a lot of times for small things, rock gardens, bonsai, stuff like that, um, because they're, they're a lot of the developed forms are dwarfs and they really don't get very big. So. That's tonight's plant, and they can be seen in Highland Park. There's a, a really good collection, as well as Durand Eastman Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. <laughs> this evening, we have uh, several proclamations scheduled. At this time, uh, would our clerk please get up and start with the first one. Thank you. Would the coaches and players from the Penfield National Little League baseball team please come forward? Also, County Executive Maggie Brooks, President Jeffrey R. Adair, and legislators Debbie Draw and E. Daniel Quattro. Whereas the members of the Penfield Little League 10 and 11 year old National League All-Star Team have just completed another successful season, winning District 4 with an 8-0 record. They beat Fairport 2-1 in the district final. Then with the skill and effort of the players and leadership of their coaches and manager, the dedicated Nationals team went on to earn a 10-0 win over Auburn in the Section 1 championship. And whereas the Penfield Nationals won the New York State Section 1 title with a 3-0 record, making them one of the final six teams in the state. 
The team then advanced to the New York State Little League Championship in the Bronx, ending their season with a final record of 11-2. and two. And whereas with the guidance and leadership of manager Mike Baxter and coaches Tom Baxter, Greg Camp, Jeff Griggs, and Dave Novoy, the Penfield Nationals ended a strong season as Section 1 champions. And whereas the hard work of all of the Penfield Nationals players and coaches led the team to an outstanding victory. Their extraordinary dedica dedication, perseverance, and sportsmanship make them role models in their school and community. The commitment this team has shown throughout their season is admirable. The future is bright for these young competitors, and Monroe County is proud to have such talented young athletes representing our community. Now therefore we, Maggie Brooks, County Executive, Jeffrey R. Adair, President, Debbie Draw, Legislator District 9, and E. Daniel Quattro, Legislator District 15, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby recognize and congratulate the Penfield National Little League Baseball Team on winning the 10 and 11 year olds New York Section 1 Championship. Congratulations. Thank you very much for this honor. Um, on behalf of the, the other coaches and all the players, um, we thank you. This is something that I'm sure they'll all remember uh, for years to come. Thank you. Would Amy Widger please come forward? Also, President Jeffrey R. Adair and Legislator Robert J. Colby. Whereas Cornell Cooperative Extension of Monroe County enables people to improve their lives and communities through partnerships that put experience and research knowledge to work. And whereas the Cornell Cooperative Extension System utilizes the partnership between federal, state, and local governments, as well as Cornell University, students, volunteers, and staff to develop programs that put experience and knowledge to work. And whereas 4-H Youth Development has served 430 youth through long-term intensive club participation and more than 1,000 youth through community projects and school partnerships in Monroe County in 2012. And whereas Cornell Cooperative Extension through the 4-H Youth Development Program invests in the state's future by creating opportunities for youth to develop their personal leadership skills, contribute to their communities, and strengthen their science and training abilities. And whereas, Cornell Cooperative Extension will continue to provide high quality, innovative, innovative educational programs and products that help New Yorkers build strong and vibrant communities through this unique partnership between CCE Monroe County and Monroe County government. Now therefore, we, Jeffrey R. Adair, Monroe County Legislature President, and Robert J. Colby, Legislator District 20, designate the week of October through the of October 7th through the 13th, 2012, as Cornell Cooperative Extension Week and National 4-H Week, and urge people of Monroe County to take advantage of the many opportunities and programs available through Cornell Cooperative Extension and the 4-H Youth Development Program. Congratulations.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Robin Travis, and I'm the interim executive director for Cornell Cooperative Extension. I retired after a 35-year career with Cornell Cooperative Extension and uh, got a call this spring to come back and uh, serve Monroe County Cooperative Extension for a while, so I've been here uh, since May. Um, I have with us tonight um, some of our key staff people uh, over here, Amy Matichek and uh, Abigail, uh, Keith Alexander, and Amy Widger. Where'd Amy go? Amy back there taking pictures. Um, I also have members of the K-9 Kids and our Citizen U uh, Teen Club, and I know you would much rather hear from some of them instead of me, um, and so I'm going to invite Joyce Parker to it, say a few words. Hi everyone, I am Joyce Parker, and I'm a student at the Rochester City School, School of the Arts. Uh, I am a sophomore, I'm 16 years old, and I'm part of the uh, Rochester Citizen U program, which is also a part of the 4-H. Uh, this program, like, I am so happy that I, you know, I was, I was one of the youth that actually got into it. Because it ever since I've started like a year and a half ago, I've become a totally different person, um, and bad I mean better. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the Rochester Citizen U basically bring youth to get, uh, together, and they help us do a lot of things for our communities. Um, we, us as youth, we see a lot of things that goes on around us. And we want to make a difference. We want to make a change. And we feel as though there's no better way to do it than, you know, us actually being the ones to do it. So we, we have these guys here that will help us. And we'll come up with project, uh, projects and stuff to, you know, <laughs> we'll come up with projects to help us help our community and, you know, change certain things that we don't like and that we feel as though we have those hands that the people need. And um, the program is actually two. Well, it's one, but it's separated. There's the southwest side, and then there's the southeast, the east side. Um, and I am from the west side. I'm a southwest kid. And we have came together and put a lot of different projects together. One was at City Hall, the bell ringing. Uh, that was basically for um, Salvation Army to get some money and donate it to them, give it to them. And we did a walk for homeless, a march for homeless youth. Um, we went to Albany, which was great. Uh, we went to Ithaca and um, we just recently, on the 1st of September, we did a, a fashion show, and it was based on stereotyping. The youth on the west side, we came together. We said, okay, you know what? A lot of kids nowadays get stereotyped, especially in school. And we want to come up with a creative way to actually deliver a message to uh, other youth out there and let them know this is not okay. Um, we don't just want to hand out flyers because you know how you walk around, you see little flyers that tell you don't do this and don't do that. We don't want to do that. We actually want to show them in a creative way, let them know, you know what, what you're doing, it's wrong. And so we put together a fashion show and people came. And, you know, it was great because that's getting people's attention in a creative way. I'm not just going to, if I go there, I'll if I was the audience, I would have never been bored because it was great. And I got a message. I walked away with the message. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm just so glad that I got to be one of the people that was actually chosen for the program. I would sit at home and be like, okay, you know, I'm bored. There's nothing to do, um, this and that. When there's actually programs out there that you could actually go to and, you know, I became better with school. Yeah. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Katherine Stevens. 
this is my well starting in the fall this will be my fifth year in four in 4-H. I'm part of Monroe K-9 County Kids. I feel like this program has really helped me boost my confidence. I really, like in the beginning when I, at school, I wouldn't even, I would have trouble talking in front of my, in front of my classmates. If I had to say an answer, I'd, it'd usually take me about five minutes for me to get it out. And I don't know, I just had a terrible time with that. And I feel like since I started doing 4-H because it kind of it kind of helps you just get out there and it teaches you values that like school they teach you that too but I kind of feel like 4-H kind of helps you learn them in a different way like perseverance when I started training my dog I was completely lost because she was a puppy and everybody else was a lot more experienced than I was and all she kind of wanted to do was spin and sniff everything and say hello I was I was really stuck and I didn't know what to do really, but I don't know. I just didn't want to give up and I just kept pulling through. And just a while ago, before state fair, I got a first place ribbon, and I was very happy because I remember because it kind I kind of remember what happened when I first tried this. I felt like I don't know. I just my my dog she wouldn't respond. She just wanted to go over wherever there was food. She just wanted to go over there was people. She wanted to go over wherever there was horse poop. But she's made a lot of progress since then. And I feel like it's really paid off. And it, I feel like I've, like, now I'm talking in front of <laughs> lots of people. <laughs> and I feel like that is a very big difference to not being able to talk in front of your classmates. And the progress that I've made, I'm very proud of it. And I don't know what might have happened if I didn't do this. I'd probably, I'd probably still be mumbling my, school's, my school essays and stuff. But it's like my dogs, uh, both of them are really nice to have. And I feel like being able to do something with them just kind of makes it even more like more fun to have a dog and I kind of like activities like that because I don't know it just have, has been really fun you know yeah thank you thank you very much for your continuing support Would Bridget Hughes, Sarah Navarez, Lindsey Wall, Officer Paul Donderfor, Officer Adam Elliott, and Dr. David Lambery please come forward? Also, President Jeffrey R. Adair and legislators Anthony Daniele, Ted O'Brien, Willie Joe Lightfoot, and Joshua Baroff. Whereas, <clears throat> on Wednesday, August 15th, three first-year students and an associate dean at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry were enjoying a school-sponsored picnic at Genesee Valley Park, while two Rochester police officers were taking their lunch break nearby. At the same time, John Clayton, a, F a Florida resident in Rochester visiting the nearby Ronald McDonald House, was walking his children down the canal path. And whereas a sunny, relaxing time outdoors for all involved quickly changed when the stroller carrying Mr. Clayton's two eight-year-old children careened down an embankment and into the murky canal waters. Without a second thought, Mr. Clayton jumped in the water to save his children, but was unable to get them out by himself. And whereas seconds later, a passerby noticed the commotion and sped on his bicycle to the picnic site to seek assistance for Mr. Clayton and, and his children while another witness called 911. Thankfully, medical students Lindsey Wall, Sarah Navarez, and Bridget Hughes, as well as Senior Associate Dean of Medical Education, Dr. David Lambury, immediately rushed into action in an attempt to rescue the Clayton family. While Rochester police officers Adam Elliott, 
and Paul Donderfor received the call for assistance and rushed in to help. And whereas due to their heroic efforts, the rescuers were able to su successfully extricate the kids and the father from the water. Without the selfless actions of Dr. Lambery, Ms. Wall, Ms. Navarez, Ms. Hughes, as well as officers Elliot and Donderfor, the tragedy on August 15th would have undoubtedly been worse. Now, therefore, let it be known that we, Jeffrey R. Dare, President, Anthony Danielli, Majority Leader, Ted O'Brien, Minority Leader, Willie Joe Lightfoot, Assistant Minority Leader, and Joshua Braugh, Deputy Minority Leader, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby honor Bridget Hughes, Sarah Navarez, Lindsey Wall, Officer Paul Donderfor, Officer Adam Elliott, and Dr. David Lambery for their selfless actions to save three people, including two children from the waters of the Erie Canal. Thank you. Officer Dondorfer uh, couldn't be here tonight, but he sends his uh, grateful appreciation for everything in your time tonight. Thank you so much. the public forum. We have several people registered to address the legislature. Mrs. Rossi. If you were, require assistance, a deputy will assist you in approaching the lectern. Please come forward and be prepared to address the legislature when your name is called. Each speaker will have two minutes and we ask that you conclude your remarks when the timer sounds and we thank you for your cooperation. Our first speaker will be Doug Murrell. Uh, my name is Doug Morrell. I'm from uh, Local 13 Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Union, and uh, we're having a uh, on October 13th uh, a heat on day where we go out to the community and we help uh, people who can't afford to have their heating system checked out. Uh, we do it all free or repaired, and we're um, welcoming any of the county legislatures to come out here. Last year we did 125 homes. There was some county legislatures did show up. We're offering it to everybody, and there will be a flyer um, coming to the mail to you that I left in the office here. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Anna Sears. Good evening, members of the legislature and audience. I'm Anna Sears and reside in Brighton. I'm grateful for this opportunity to summarize for you another issue about high volume fracking that will put Monroe County at risk. Here's one thing we should all be able to agree upon. The oil and gas industry wields enormous power and they've successfully lobbied Congress for decades to get laws in place to be exempted from existing laws to make their business easier and more profitable. Some of these exemptions include seven major federal health and safety laws that were created to protect us and our water, land, and air from toxic pollution. In 2005, the oil and gas industry was exempted from the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, the Superfund Law, the National Environmental Policy Act, and number seven, the Toxic Release Inventory. 
If, as the industry claims, the fracking chemicals are safe, why, we can't but ask ourselves, why did they need these exemptions in the first place? Opening Monroe County waste facilities to fracking waste and drill cuttings will not only mess up the facilities they aren't designed to accept, toxins like radon, but would leave our county roads at risk from accidental spills while the waste is en route to the facility. With so many of our lakes and rivers already highly polluted, dilution is no longer the solution to pollution. I've given the clerk's office for distribution 29 copies of this double-sided flyer called Loopholes for Polluters that covers these exemptions in further depth. I do hope that you will take the time to read them. Thank you for your attention to this most urgent matter of our time, protecting our water, land, and air. Thank you. Our next speaker is Audrey Newcomb. I'm Audrey Newcomb from Sifting and Winnowing. Are we burning the furniture to save the house? That's what a frustrated Pennsylvania public official said about what fracking's done to his state. But it's hard to claim that fracking will even save the house because of its global nature. A natural gas industry rapidly merging with oil giants like ExxonMobil is laying down pipeline networks to ship our gas overseas where <clears throat> producers can get three to nine times the price. When our stored at great cost gas runs out, scarcity will help their profits to soar along with our heating bills. Fracking creates few permanent jobs. Fatality rates for fracking's few permanent jobs are 8% higher than for those similarly employed elsewhere. Most hirees are experienced frackers from Texas. Local corporations don't care about Monroe County or New York State or the United States any more than they care about Iraq or Nigeria. When one well is finished, it's on to the next, often sooner than predicted. Fewer than a third of the wells perform long term, yielding heavily at first then dropping off sharply. The leaseholder, already stripped of rights by antiquated laws, is left with an abandoned will, unsaleable land, and no profit. Although it is estimated that New York State would gain $22 billion from fracking over 20 years, the proven gain from traditional enterprises like tourism, farming, hunting, and winemaking over 20 years would bring in $418 billion, 19 times the speculated gas drilling gain. Fracking will destroy these jobs that New York already provides, even as lakes, rivers, farms, drinking water, health, and quality of life are laid waste. Can you believe that these multi-billion dollar industries expect us to be gullible enough to subsidize their projects with our taxes and for our own good? Our next speaker is Ken Matheson. I'm here once again on behalf of the uh, Shooters Committee on Political Education and Gun Owners of uh, Monroe County. It was brought to my attention during the fire drill that some of you may still be a little unclear of what we're asking for regarding to the county parks law that bans all firearms within the county parks. We're not asking you to create any kind of new law that authorizes people to carry guns in the parks. What we're asking you to do is make Monroe County law compliant with the Constitution and New York State law. This law that bans all firearms in the county parks with regards to licensed concealed carry is unconstitutional because the Supreme Court says it is. It is unenforceable because Penal Law 400 says that local law doesn't matter when it becomes to, uh, comes to a valid license. And it is also invalid because the appellate courts have said so, that the state of New York is the only political entity in the state of New York that is authorized to regulate handguns in any way. 
So all we're asking you to do is to change this law to make it compliant with New York state law. Because it's there, it's still a danger to law-abiding gun owners, and it's a, a liability to Marone County. If a law-abiding gun owner happens to get arrested in one of these parks, has his guns taken away, and if everything works out, he gets everything back, it still costs him a ton of money, and he's going to sue the county. It's a liability to the county, to the, to the taxpayers of the county. It's just bad law, and it needs to be fixed. Democrats, you shouldn't have a problem with this because you're not authorizing anything new. Republicans, the only thing holding you back is your leadership, Brooks and Riley. You need to get over it, get done with it. We're not asking you to do anything new. Just change the law to make it compliant with New York state law. That's all we want out of you. That's what we're asking. That's what we need. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Larry Pratt. I'm here on behalf of Gun Owners of America. My name is Larry Pratt. A number of members here in Monroe County ask that we take part in the proceedings tonight. I'd like to focus on the danger of gun-free zones. You may be surprised to learn that there are no studies that have ever been done before enactment of gun-free zones, and yet we have them based on uh, the assumption that somehow telling a criminal not to break a law will somehow make a criminal obey a law. It doesn't work that way. Of all of the mass murders that have occurred in our country since the 90s when we began fooling around with these kinds of gun-free zones, all of the mass murders have occurred in gun-free zones. So the effort to keep people safe by unilaterally disarming the good guys while not doing anything to reach the criminal has very adverse consequences and hopefully is something that won't continue here in the county. The, um, I think you really need to demand of those who are pro propounding this kind of policy, where is the problem? Where have we had problems where people are lawfully carrying concealed firearms? In fact, the problem is in the areas where you have your gun-free zones, and I hope the county will decide to, as the previous speaker was pointing out, put itself in compliance with state law. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julie Clayton. Good evening to uh, all the legislators and members of the audience. My name is Julie Clayton. I live in Brighton and I'm serving as president of the Burroughs Audubon Nature Club. Our membership consists of about 300 and our members live throughout Monroe County. Our members and I are very concerned about horizontal hydrofracking. It's a well-known fact that water, not oil, not even natural gas, is and will be the commodity of high demand and most value. It is water, clean, potable water, that we need to protect. According to Science News, the most recent one, just one typical fract, fract well uses between 2 million and 8 million gallons of water. At the high end, that's enough to fill 12 Olympic swimming pools. As the gas comes out of the fract well, a lot of this fluid comes back as waste. 25 of the additive chemicals are listed as hazardous pollutants under the Clean Air Act, nine are regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act, and 14 are known or possible human carcinogens, including naphthalene and benzene. In addition to the fracking fluid, the flow back contains water from the bowels of the earth. It contains a lot of salt, along with the naturally occurring radioactive material, mercury, arsenic, and other heavy materials. This is what will happen to our millions of gallons of clean water. In just 81,000 to 200 wells that the industry plans for New York State will consume and pollute 6.6 .6 trillion gallons of fresh water. And there are just a few incidents to think about. There are a lot of them, but this is just a few. 
From 200, 2003 to 2008 in Colorado, 1,549 spill incidents with more than 20 percent impacting groundwater. 1990 to 2005 in New Mexico, there are 705 groundwater contaminating incidents. 2010, and, and, uh, oh well, okay, I just want one sentence. According to Webster's Dictionary, a harebrained plan is one without thought of the consequence. I don't think that Monroe County wishes to be a part of the harebrained plan. Please think of the consequences and vote to ban horizontal hydrofracking anywhere in Monroe County. Act courageously and be heroes to the people of our beautiful county. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Kastner. Good evening, my name is John Kastner. I live in Rochester and uh, I'm here to speak about um, hydrofracking in Monroe County. Water, of course, is the big issue. The process of hydrofracking not only requires enormous quantities of it, millions of gallons per well, it, t it mixes it with an intentionally toxic brew of hundreds of chemicals such as benzene, toluene, xylene, ethylene glycol, and diesel fuel. Almost half of it then come becomes toxic waste which is essentially untreatable. The biocides kill the bacteria that the treatment facilities use to neutralize harmful pathogens in sewage, and the ethylene glycol melts the filter membranes that strain out solids and larger pathogens. While New York State has an abundance of water, no supply is inexhaustible. Many wells run dry, ran dry this summer with the, with the drought. New York State also uses enormous amounts of water for its dairy, ag, and wine industries, as well as for municipal use and recreational use. Transporting fracking waste threatens all drinking water sources. Fracking has an atrocious record of spill after spill, destroying or compromising public water. In Pennsylvania, a spill took out Pittsburgh's water supply for three months. Water is life, plain and simple, for us now and for our children and their children and their children. The future is literally in your hands. Please, no fracking in Monroe County and no handling of dangerous, untreatable fracking waste. Let us join the over 200 communities in New York State that have enacted or are considering bans of this lethal practice. And may I also point out this, uh, this book written by uh, uh, former Gannett reporter uh, Tom Wilbur, which has a lot more information under the surface. Um, it's a very easy and fast read and contains a lot of the information been discussed this evening. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sister Grace Miller. I had another talk prepared until I heard that a proposal was submitted to the Republicans or to the legislature. It is accepted, and our hope is that it is going to committee and will be discussed in committee and not die in committee. Because we won't let this issue die. We're going to remain on top of it. We are planning a meeting with the legislators, GRCC, and Kelly Reed, Bob Franklin, which will be sometime in the early part of October, and we're hoping to have success at this meeting regarding the burial issue. I go to many funerals and wakes, and I see great discrepancy between the funerals and wakes of the wealthy and the poor. There is actually no comparison. All the money that is spent on wakes and funerals for the wealthy, and you are planning yours, I'm sure, and those of your loved ones, and you want the best funeral and wake for your loved ones. The poor want the same thing, but they do not have the money that you have. So we are asking you to please take these proposals and study them, and please move with compassion and justice love and concern for our poor when you are discussing these issues. The mandate in the Bible, in scripture, 
is to bury our dead with dignity and respect and spirituality. And many of you and many of our people need to visit the graves of their loved ones to bring them peace and comfort. And I would also add that if you're asking the poor to be cremated instead of buried, what are they going to do with the remains, the ashes, when they are evicted from their homes and everything they have is thrown out in the streets? You don't have that problem, but the poor do. So we're asking you to please take this issue very seriously and work with us in giving our poor decent, dignified, and for many of them, Christian burials. Our next speaker is Rita Lewis. I just want to say this evening that it is my hope and my prayer that Democrats and Republicans will come together on this issue of burying the poor and come to the realization that it's only the right thing to do to provide the cemetery plot, the casket, the essentials for burial of the poor. That's all we're asking for, the essentials for a proper burial. And so I really hope and pray that the county finds the money somewhere, somehow. I really don't care how it's done, but just so every poor person who comes to the county and is asking for help for the burial of their loved ones receive that with dignity and compassion. That's all we're asking for. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dwayne Wilder. Hello, my name is Dwayne Wilder. I reside at uh, uh, 289 Riches Dugway in Rochester. Um, I'm here to speak about a little addressed issue in hydrofracking, and that is insurance liability for municipalities and by extension to any governmental body who allows fracking uh, on their property. Um, I will be reading from the uh, summer issue of the Insurance Recovery Advisor published by Offit Kerman, uh, uh, Attorneys at Law. Their specialty is uh, uh, insurance recovery practice advisors to uh, the insurance company. Uh, despite assurances that the process of fracking is clean and safe, it is nevertheless imperative that municipalities, property owners, and mineral rights owners evaluate how to best protect themselves from the gambit of fracking-related claims and litigation, which will include everything from on-the-job injuries to environmental contamination. There has been surprisingly little discussion of the role that insurance and contractual risk transfer can play in protecting municipalities and property owners from these claims. While every situation is unique, here are some considerations for municipalities and property owners when evaluating whether they are adequately protected from claims arising out of fracking. First, contractual indemnity provisions. Municipalities need to investigate the financial solvency of the entity signing the oil and gas lease or applying for the oil and gas permit, particularly where larger corpor cor corporations are using LLCs and subsidiaries and subcontractors. 
I will leave you to uh, read through the rest of this. I've highlighted uh, portions that will be of particular interest for government. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shaiquan Woods. Good evening, my name is Shaikron Woods. I am here tonight to speak on the issue of DSS, the long lines we have at 691 St. Paul Street. I'm saying to myself, like, why do we go here? We have to stand in these long lines, just wait to be seen. Doesn't make sense. These lines be way out the door. You have people with kids that have to stand outside the doors. And then on the other topic, you wait to get your food stamps on your card and your cash and you don't get them. I was supposed to get mine the ninth of this month. I never got them. And I'm still wondering why my caseworker hasn't done nothing to help me. I want to send a special thank you to Kelly Reed for getting my Medicaid back up and going because if it wasn't for her, my Medicaid wouldn't be back on right now and I wouldn't be able to get my medicine and stuff that I need. And I also want to speak on one more topic, the burial issue, the loss of our loved ones, what we have to go through to get them in a safe place. We know we don't want them cremated. Some want them cremated, some don't. But if you love your loved ones like you're supposed to, just think of a way to just do what you have to do to get everything done that you need to get done. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tom Gregory. I just want to say something about uh, editorial that appeared in Gannett newspapers, which frankly I, take, I took objection to. If you think about it, you know, we've turned some really uh, positive people out of this legislative body and sent them up to Albany. Uh, and we're going to send one or the other. It's going to be either uh, Mr. O'Brien or it's going to be Mr. O'Hanna who's going to go up as a senator. Uh, everyone knows from the dealings here with this legislature that the rapport that has existed between the minority side and the majority side has been much alleviated. Uh, it's been very good because of Mr. O'Brien. But on the other hand, I want to say something about Mr. Hanna. He always spoke, he always worked here as a legislator with the highest regard. Nothing you could under, undermine his personal character. But I had an experience with Mr. Hanna that leads me to uh, believe and strongly believe that there is no reason in the world why anyone should make an ethical complaint against him. And that was when he was ahead of the DEC. I was able to actually contact him from experiences I've had here with this legislative body and tell him about a man who was in a really tough spot. And Mr. Hanna came from that office, I think he was up on Scottsville Road at, the, at that time, came right over the site and got the whole thing rectified. Now, this isn't the kind of man who's going to do anything that's unethical. So I hope that's complaint or concern or accusation or presumption of accusation is withdrawn. And I don't think Annette's doing us a justice by leaving in little hanging things there of the presumption that someone's doing wrong when he's not doing anything wrong at all. I can stand by both Mr. O'Brien and I can stand by Mr. Hanna and say both of these are quality gentlemen and quite frankly, in my opinion anyhow, uh, there shouldn't be any ethical concerns in this county, let alone amongst this elected body. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is John Smith. Good evening. Can July in this hall, a gentleman with wisdom beyond his years, who's a little older than I, than I am, either reminded you or informed some of you for the very first time where the rights of individuals are derived from. They do not come from government. They come from our creator. 
The Founding Fathers eloquently stated in the, in the Declaration of, of Independence this fact. They stated these truths are self-evident. That is, to the leaders in America in the 1770s, this concept was so obvious that it did not need further explanation. Unfortunately, in 236 years, various legislatures of uh, this country uh, have fallen quite a bit. This is the Constitution. Every single legislator in here, every single public officer in here took an oath to uphold it. Actually, yeah, they swore an oath, swore either an oath or affirmation technically. This is the supreme civil law. In here is the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment recognizes a pre-existing right to self-defense. You have to acknowledge that. If you don't, you will be sued. Worse, you may put someone's life at risk because they, weren't, they were deprived of the right to defend themselves, not by the real supreme law of the land, but by a bunch of people afraid of what the Democrat and Chronicle are going to say about them. This goes for both sides of the aisle here. You took an oath. You have a lawful obligation to uphold this. you got to do it. That's it. This concludes the public forum. At this time, we'll recess the September 11th, 2012 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature for the purpose of convening the Pure Waters Administration Board for the Northwest Quadrant, Pure Waters District. The clerk will please note the attendance and read the item on the agenda. PWAB <laughs> number one, referral 12-264, authorizing. Moved by Legislator Holland, seconded by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing no discussion, all in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. We will now recess the Northwest Quadrant Pure Water District and adjourn the Pure Waters Administration Board. The September 11, 2012 meeting of the legislature is now reconvened. We will now continue with considerations of motions, resolutions, and notice. Will the clerk please read the next item on the agenda? Item number one, referral 12-234, confirmation of appointments. Moved by Legislator Valerio, seconded by Legislator Draw. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number two, referral 12-235. Moved by Legislator Holland, second by Legislator Ancello. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. President. And I, I'm not sure that I have any particular objection to any of the uh, individuals that are uh, up for a reappointment to the Monroe County Water Authority Board, but I do think this affords us an opportunity uh, to correct kind of a longstanding problem that we have, and that is that the enabling legislation that created the Monroe County Water Authority Board provided that there be representation by two parties. The, um, and, and then, of course, the spirit and intent of the law was there be majority and, and minority representation. Um, so while there may have been some kind of a technical compliance with the enabling legislation, there certainly hasn't been an attempt to fulfill the intent of the uh, legislation. <clears throat> and I think this is an opportunity for us to correct that. So, Mr. President, in, in accordance with Section 545.17c of our rules, I move that the question before us in referral 120235, confirmation of reappointments to Monroe County Water Authority, be committed to the next meeting of the Agenda Charter Committee in order to consider new appointments to help change the membership of the Water Authority Board to meet the spirit of the law. If there's a second. Second. We have a motion made by Legislator O'Brien, seconded by Legislator Andrews. Is there any discussion at this time to the amendment? Legislator O'Brien. Just a, a few comments. I, I think that, as I've said, this is an opportunity for us to revisit this question, understand uh, the party registrations. My understanding is that we have, uh, while there may be two parties, we have Republicans and conservatives, which really doesn't quite fulfill the intent of the uh, enabling legislation, which was really for um, majority minority party representation, in my, in my view. And uh, so I think we're able to correct uh, that problem. I think that leads to a better uh, oversight ability of a board when there are opposing uh, party perspectives, um, uh, uh, monitoring 
uh, the operations at the Monroe County Water Authority, and I think the best practice would be for us to send this back to agenda charter. Let's take a look at what we can do to reform the board in a way that complies with the spirit of the law. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Seeing none, I'll move to a roll call vote on the amendment. Mr. Daniele? No. Mr. O'Brien? Mrs. Aldersley? Yes. Mr. Ancello? Yes. Ms. Andrews? No. I'm sorry? Ms. Andrews? Mr. Antelli? No. Mr. Barker? Yes. Mr. Baroth? Yes. Ms. Boyce? Mr. Colby? No. Mrs. Draw? No. Mr. Gamble is excused. Mr. Gamina? Mr. Haney? Mr. Hanna? Mr. Holland? Ms. Cayley? Mr. John Lightfoot? Mr. Willie Lightfoot? Mr. McCann? Mr. Michike? Mr. Patterson? Dr. Quattro? Mr. Rocco? Mr. Tucciarello? Mrs. Valerio? Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Mr. Yolovich? No. President Adair? No. 11 to 17, commit to committee fails. Okay, back to the main motion. Is there any other discussion? Legislator Daniele? Yes, Mr. President. I, I just would like to uh, express why I will be voting yes on this. The public authorities law, which is something done at the state level, clearly states that uh, it shall consist of seven members, no more than five, whom shall belong to one political party. And although uh, Minority Leader O'Brien's <clears throat> comment of the intent of the law, uh, there are many laws out there that actually state majority minority. They give specific counts. So I would argue that if the intent was majority and minority, that it would say that. And, and uh, just to correct the record, although there are five Republicans, there, is also, there are also two conservatives and an independent uh, on this board as well. So I will be voting yes, and I would encourage my colleagues to do the same. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Cayley. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to um, say that my vote on this will be no, and for basically the reasons that Legislator um, O'Brien stated earlier, I, I realize that when you talk about the spirit of the law, it's vague in this case, but if we always thought that the spirit of the law was vague, very little would get done the way that we think it should get done, and I feel that there should be a better representation on this board. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Patterson. This board is perceived to be rife with cronyism and nepotism. It is time for some cleaning here. It is time for some bipartisan action here. It is time to restore the credibility of this board. We add folks from the other side so that the folks outside understand that there is some oversight, so that they understand that other folks' friends aren't just being taken care of, that the greater good is being taken care of, and yes, a board made up of a majority of Republicans, conservatives, and an independent, <laughs> there's no bipartisanship there. That's comedy. And I will be voting no. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Excuse me. I didn't give the floor to you. Legislator Daniele. I would just like to point out uh, that there are liaisons appointed from this body to this board. Uh, the, these board meetings are open meetings that are open to the public. 
Uh, and I know uh, on our side, I believe Legislator Colby is our representative on this board, and I know he's attended these meetings, and I'm not sure who the legislative liaison from the minority side is, but I would certainly encourage them to attend the meetings and uh, know that they are open and that the decisions are made in public and uh, you know, if, if there was anything going on at the meetings that would be a concern to this body, I would hope that that liaison would bring that to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Legislator Yolovich? Uh, Mr. Daniel, made my point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Andrews. Thank you, Mr. President. Not to belabor the point, but I am aware there are legislative liaisons to this board. However, my belief is that when the board moves into executive session, those legislative liaisons are not allowed to attend the executive session portion of the meeting, which obviously is where a lot of important business is discussed. So that doesn't actually fulfill a purpose um, of having bipartisan representation if there's only a legislative liaison from this side of the aisle that attends those meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Aldersley. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'd just like to comment that we had a uh, violation of ethics, apparently, at the Water Authority uh, a few years ago. Um, a person well known to all of us was accused of criminal wrongdoing, and um, there was an effort made at that time to make the Water Authority more uh, responsive to ethical concerns. And I would like to comment that ethics requires us to just because we can do something that is unethical, um, that the law allows it, ethics requires us to do the right thing nonetheless. And the right thing here is to make certain that uh, all stakeholders in the community are represented on the Water Authority Board. Floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I actually have a couple questions um, to you, to the administration. Were any other individuals um, considered for these uh, positions? Is that through me to the administration? Yes. Um, I made these appointments. Then I'll, ask, I'll redirect to you. Okay, I sir. made these appointments that all three of these people have had longevity on here. All of them have. Um, been on there. We've um, had a very good board in the last few years, and they all wanted to do it again, so I re-upped them. So then the answer is there was no other That's concern. my answer. I'll interpret it that way then. Well, that's my answer. Fair enough. Then my follow-up question is, um, just for a little clarification, you mentioned there was a well, uh, well-functioning board. Um, was there a particular rubric used to uh, evaluate the performance of these three reappointments? Was there a what? A rubric, um, a set of no, the there objectives. Was no, there was not. No. None. Nope. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your answer. So do that, I'll be voting You're against welcome. them. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Aldersley. Mr. President, a, a question, if I may. Um, at the time that uh, the Water Authority Board was very much in the news, and uh, there were a great number of questions about um, financial management out there, uh, one of the reforms that was suggested by the the group that was convened to study the Water Authority and make ethical recommendations uh, recommended that um, Water Authority board members no longer be considered full-time employees of the county uh, receiving uh, full retirement benefits such as medical care. And the, uh, as I recall, the solution uh, was reached that new members of the Water Authority board would not in the future be considered full-time employees and receive lifetime retirement benefits. And I'm wondering if uh, these new appointments of old board members, uh, a couple of which in fact, well at least one I know for sure was, was present on the board uh, during the time when oversight was uh, unfortunately not uh, taken care of properly, will, will these new appointments New, new today, um, will those folks be receiving uh, uh, their retirement benefits or are, will they be treated as new uh, Water Authority board members? Legislator Aldersley, unless I miss my guess and someone can correct me from the other side over on the table here, I believe that since they are being re-upped, I don't believe that they're being considered new. 
Thank you. I, I'd like to say that I don't approve of that. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Legislator John Lightfoot. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. President, thank you very much. Just for the record and to my colleagues, um, I would like to see uh, a Democrat on the board. I have a, uh, some interest in seeing some oversight for that from my side of the aisle. And um, I just want to make a, make a statement for the record. And I also want to say that Democrats pay water taxes too. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this point? If not, we'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Daniele? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? No. Mrs. Aldersley? No. Mr. Ancello? Yes. Ms. Andrews? Yes. Mr. Antelli? Yes. Mr. Barker? Yes. Mr. Baroth? Yes. Ms. Boyce? Yes. Mr. Colby? Yes. Mrs. Draw? Yes. Mr. Gamble is excused. Mr. Gamina? Mr. Haney, Mr. Hanna, Mr. Holland, Ms. Cayley, Mr. John Lightfoot, Mr. Willie Lightfoot, Mr. McCann, Mr. Michike, Mr. Patterson, Dr. Quattro, Mr. Rocco, Mr. Tucciarello, Mrs. Valerio, yes. Mr. Wilcox, yes. Mr. Yolovich, yes. President Adair. Yes. 1810. Next item. Item number three, referral 12-236, confirmation of appointment to Monroe County Traffic Safety Board. Moved by Legislator Colby, seconded by Legislator Ancelo. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next. Item number four, referral 12-238, authorizing. Moved by, moved by legislators Willie Lightfoot, moved by legislator Draw, seconded by legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Willie Lightfoot. Mr. President, um, first and foremost, I just want to say um, this is a great opportunity a great day uh, for this legislature, this body. Uh, as I'm in the um, participate, participation in government classes, Mrs. P. Cass over at Aquinas uh, that I do, um, I often take the young people through uh, page number 63 in our um, county uh, directory, which talks about the legislative process. And there's five steps in that legislative process. And when I go through all five of those steps, they always ask me, doesn't that feel good to be able to um, get ideas from the people or come up with them yourselves and then be able to go through this process and get these things passed. And that's when I always kind of cringe uh, because <laughs> it actually doesn't feel good it's, um, at times because oftentimes right around step three is, is where the shot gets blocked and, and um, you know, it doesn't happen uh, for, on this side of the aisle. So uh, it'd be nice to go back to Mrs. P class and talk about legislative process again and uh, talk about how that we actually did take ideas from the people uh, that came and, and talked about the, 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 the concern that they had, the overbearing uh, fees that they had. And then we, we took that and we had communication, which is step two. And that communication, I like to add, you know, not just communication, but it was by communication, you know, just making my own little word up there, because it was that. We, we got together, we communicated, we talked uh, about this particular issue, and then it was a sign. It was a sign and it made it in, it passed uh, into the committee, and then it's here for the full legislature vote, which I'm happy to say through the communication that we had and the by understanding, another word I'm making up, um, that we have a bipartisan opportunity to do some things here that are good for the people. But the most important thing that I tell these young people uh, at this class is that it starts with the people majority of the time, and it ends with the people because they're the ones that have to get are the results of what we do in this chambers. They're the ones that have to uh, that get either whether it's positive or negative based on the laws or the resolutions that we provide and that we vote on for here today. So going across, taking my daughter to Robert Weston College, as his first year as a forensic uh, as a forensic student out there, and I'm passing 
down the street uh, on, on Route 33, and what do I see? A big, huge uh, display or poster or, or you know, in the lawn that says farmer market. And, it's, you know, and, and it just really did my heart well to be able to turn to my daughter and say, you know what, that farmer market might be twice as big next year because of what the rules that we did here and the work that we did here uh, providing micro businesses, I don't call them small businesses, I call them micro businesses, that we are allowing the opportunity to do business and provide healthy foods for our community. So I thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, the majority leader and those who have come together for this. Not often do we get to say yay together, but I hope that we use this uh, as a blueprint for future by communication, by understanding, to get to bipartisan so that we can do things that are going to help the people in our community. So I support this and I thank my colleagues and everyone else and, and, and encourage them to support it as well. Thank you. We'll digest that a little bit now. And we do 95% of the time do say yay together. So that's a little thing that I do when I have people come in, classes come in here. Is there any other discussion on item number four at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number five, referral 12-240, confirmation of... Moved by Legislator Draw, second by Legislator Quattro. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Item Next. number six, referral 12-241. Moved by Legislator Draw, second by Legislator Quattro. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Item number seven, referral 12-242, accepting grant from New York State. Moved by Legislator Hanna, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number eight, referral 12-243, accepting aid to localities. Moved by Legislator Hanna, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Item number nine, referral 12-244, accepting grant from New York State. Moved by Legislator Hanna, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 10, referral 12-245, authorizing. Moved by Legislator Gamina, seconded by Legislators Hanna and Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Patterson. Through the chair to the administration, what particular additional services are the county vehicles receiving that justify the school district receiving an additional 10 cents per gallon of fuel, additional 10 cents per gallon of fuel that we purchased there. Through the chair, um, sir, the additional 10 cents a gallon as I believe may have been mentioned previously, covers the fact that um, the, the school district uh, built the pumps, mans the pumps, um, you know, maintains the pumps, purchases additional fuel more frequently because the sheriff's office uses that fuel. Um, we recently negotiated uh, Churchill Chilai down from 5% over state contract levels to 10 cents a gallon over. Um, very frankly, the, the budget people in the sheriff's office feel that it's a very good deal for us. It saves us a tremendous amount of money in that we don't have to send our cars from various places in the county to the fleet center and gates. Um, not only does that save us gas in the long run, but it saves our deputies from being tied up driving to and from fleet 
they can stay out on the road longer. It's a completely beneficial um, situation for us, but that is where the 10 cents per gallon goes. Okay. Well, through the chair, then you're saying that our purchases of fuel out there are significant enough that, I mean, it, it's, it's actually a burden upon the school district to provide this service. Is that why we're compensating them with an additional 10 cents per gallon? Is that the case? Well, I don't know if I would call it a burden. Just for instance, from Rush Henrietta School District, we purchased 80,000 gallons of gas last year. That's, okay. that's quite a lot of fuel. Um, you know, we, we do up the amount of fuel that they need. We have, you know, yes, I mean, we, we purchase quite a bit of fuel from all of the various school districts. It's, it's a very beneficial situation for us. Well, through the chair. And, and since you brought up Rush as an example, um, 80,000 gallons does sound like a lot of fuel, but I guess the question is how much fuel overall does that school district purchase? I mean, is this, a, I guess my question is, is this a significant burden upon them to uh, provide this fuel? I mean, you know, to me, 80,000 sounds like a lot, but I imagine if you've got a fleet of buses running, all your school district vehicles running back and forth, you know, that truck's in and out of there all, every day. Three more cars, four more cars coming through doesn't really seem like it's gonna be an undue burden. You know, I can't say, I, I really, frankly, Fair don't know the, the number of gallons of gasoline that the various school districts okay. do. I, I just don't. Um, I can just tell you what we use and tell you that it is a tremendous benefit to us. Okay. And um, also through the chair, are there some issues regarding um, access to the facilities? Are they secured? Um, is there some additional activity that the district has to provide in order to give those sheriff's deputies access to that fueling station? There is a, um, an access procedure. I, I'm not entirely certain of what, a, what it is, but for instance, I can't pull up no, to the, to the pumps. But So I know that there is something involved, but I apologize. I don't know exactly what it is. Okay. And, and my last question on this issue is um, through the chair. Um, as far as compensation to the school district, is there some difficulty in those folks getting remunerated in a, in a reasonable amount of time that, you know, we pay pretty quick or are we pretty slow with the pay and that's why they've got the little extra charge on there? No, we pay, we pay relatively quickly. We, you know, we, we don't make them wait because we don't like to wait either when we okay. enter into municipal agreements okay. with other places. All right, and just as a comment in, in general, you know, it seems as though I often hear in the news about a school district somewhere out in the suburbs being uh, vandalized in the evening, tires being slashed, other damage occurring. Um, you know, if I, had, if I lived in one of those districts, I'd be happy to have a sheriff's road patrol vehicle drive through there three, four times a day, going out of their way, just take a look at my buses. I'd be really happy to have that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, through you to the administration, if I heard correctly, uh, you said that you had negotiated the contract from 5% down to 10 cents. Yes, that's correct, at, through the then chair. Through the, uh, ad, through the chair, then could you give me the equitable terms of, uh, or equitable amounts of what a 5% would have been versus 10 cents per gallon? Through the chair, churchill Chile was the last district that we had gone to all of the other districts previously to negotiate down from 5% over the state contract price to 10 cents a gallon. And um, according to our budget director, based upon last year's fuel prices, it will probably end up saving the sheriff's office approximately $300 by the change. Um, but, you know, every, every bit counts, I guess. Thank um, you. Is there any other discussion at this point? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed?
the item the item carries next item Item number 11, referral 12-246, accepting grant from New York State Thruway. Moved by Legislator Hanna, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 12, referral 12-247, amending resolution. Moved by Legislator Hanna, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Boyce. All righty. Seconded by legislator voice. The records show that, please. Is there any other discussion at this time? Seeing there's none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 13, referral 12-248, accepting grant from New York State. Moved by, moved by legislator Hanna. Seconded by legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Opposed, the item carries. Item number 14, referral 12-249, accepting grant. Moved by Legislator Hanna, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, the item carries. Item number 15, referral 12-250. Moved, moved by Legislator Antelli, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Being none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, the item carries. Next item. Item number 16, referral 12-251. Moved by Legislator Draw, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, the item carries. Next item. Item number 17, referral 12-2. Moved by Legislator Draw, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 18, referral 12-253. Moved by Legislator Draw, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 19, referral 12-254, accepting. Moved by Legislator Draw, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 20, referral 12-255, authorizing. Moved by Legislator Domina, second by Legislators Draw and Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, the item carries. Next item. Item number 21, referral 12-256, accepting grant. Moved by Legislator Draw, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, the item carries. Next item. Item number 22, referral 12-257, accepting grant. Moved by Legislator Draw, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Item Next number item. 23, referral 12-258, authorizing intermunicipal. Moved by Legislator Gamina, second by Legislators Howland and Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 24, referral 12-259 BR. Moved by Legislator Holland, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 25, referral 12-260. Moved by Legislator Holland, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 26, referral 12-260 BR. Moved by Legislator Holland, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 27, referral 12-261. Moved by Legislator Howland, second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. 
Item number 28, referral 12-262, authorizing. Moved by Legislator Gamina, second by Legislator Tucciarello. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 29, referral 12-263, calling a public hearing for the purpose. Moved by Legislator Howell and second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 30, referral 12-265, confirmation of appointment. Moved by Legislator Hanna, second by Legislator Michike. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 31, referral 12-266. Moved by Legislator Yolovich, second by Legislator Gamina. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Haney. Just a quick question, Mr. President, through you. As I understand it, the way this works, the citizen will pay $25, the clerk will keep $4, and the thruway authority will get 21 The question I have, Mr. President, is how much credit does the citizen get for use on the thruway? Is it 25 or 21 through you, Mr. President, Kirk Morris, Deputy County Clerk, uh, the resident would get access to $25 credit. 25 Yes, sir. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The item carries. Is there any unfinished business to come before this body tonight? Seeing none, there's no unfinished business. Mr. Daniele. We stand adjourned until 6 p.m. on Tuesday, October 9, 2012.